Oh, what a lad. Well, today, guys, I'm honoured to have another absolute lad on the podcast for you. And today's guest probably has one of the more eventful careers out of the lot. He started off his career in the NRL with the Melbourne Storm before heading over to the Super League in England, where he played for the London Broncos and Castleford. He then changed codes to play rugby union with the Sale Sharks, where he instantly made an impact, playing for the England international side almost straight away. And now he's about to do the opposite of to what most Kiwis do, and he's moving back to New Zealand at the back end of his career to give it a crack here. And although I don't know him well, I do know he is an absolute lad. It is one of the greats, Denny Solomona. Welcome, brother. Ah, oh, cheers, my bro. What an intro. What a <laughs> bloody intro. Love it. <laughs> Mate, what a career. Like, I can't, can't believe how much stuff you've got through. You're only 28. You're only just getting started, and you've achieved all that already. Oh, mate, to be fair, like, I was only probably looking back on it a couple of days ago, maybe a week ago. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you know, people get caught up all up in, like, the future about what's going to happen. But no one really reflects on, like, um, just your life in general, where you've come from. Mm. And to do that and to get a bit of advice to do that for myself because I was, like, stressing like mad. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy moving from town to town, let alone from a full country over to half across the world, back yeah. to your hometown, you know, moving, you know, when I first came here, I only came with a suitcase thinking I was going back a month later, True. but, you know, <laughs> five years, six years went by and, you know, I've got my own little family. Um, yeah, mate, it's, it, it's mad. It's madness. And what, what's inspired this latest move back to New Zealand? Oh, to be fair, the main one was just to like get back to my my grandparents. My grandparents are not getting any younger. Um, yeah, I feel like I've missed a lot of family time, especially like crucial moments like my little nephews and nieces, you know, mm. five year old birthdays, you know, just just little things like that. I feel like I've missed a lot, and you know, I had to sacrifice a lot for for rugby. And generally, it's it's, it's generally my my family time that I had to sacrifice for my rugby. And mm-hmm. any other rugby, you know, rugby player or any sportsman out there that has a career, like, you know, they know what sacrifices are. You know, I'm sure you do too. So, like, it, it, unfortunately, it was my family that I had to sacrifice a lot. And, yeah. you know, this time now I'm putting them first and I'm coming back home and just to try and spend some, some quality time with them and then obviously get stuck into to Super Rugby, NPC. Um, just to just to play some expansive rugby, some exciting rugby, just to hopefully pick up the uh, the old legs, um, just <laughs> just to keep up with the with the old young lads out there. Mate, that's a real exciting thought. You playing Super Rugby, mate, it's going to suit you down to the T. Have you got Have you got anywhere with contracts or anything, or are you still looking? Nah, because obviously everyone's like fully booked in it, like basically MIQ. MIQ style, just gonna go in there, just see see if I'm lucky, and then uh, yeah. just try to crack a gig somewhere. I'm not too bothered, mate. Like if I'm honest, I'm just just going in with an open mind. Um, obviously, they play a way different um, play style to to England as well, so it'll just be going in there, probably spending a day or two with a couple of teams, seeing how they are, understand their philosophies, and probably get to know some of the boys and. Probably yeah. make the decision after that, but nah, nothing too solid, bro, to be fair. So when are you available? Have you finished up at sale now and you're available to move back? To New- when do you actually make your move? Oh, mate, I've been finished for a while, mate. Um, Have you? So we, me and sale, we, you know, we, we ended on, on, on pretty good terms. Um, so I've just been waiting. It's, it's that MIQ again. I think every, right. like, Every resident or citizen of, of New Zealand will understand trying to get back there. Mate, it is crazy trying to get an mm. MIQ space. And then obviously, like my flights, like so I, I was stupid. I, I booked my flights first and then I tried to book <laughs> MIQ later. So I was just like, oh, <laughs> what a nightmare. And then obviously trying to sort out like my partner and my, my daughter's visas. Yeah. Uh, so I did everything backwards like an absolute spaz. <laughs> so you said you ended up with sale uh, on a good note. Was that at the end of your contract or did you manage to get out of your contract? Because I know you're a legend over there at sale. 
Yeah, to be fair, obviously, like, you know, I think, you know, new coach came in, um, you know, philosophy changed, you know, although I was, I was keen, I was dead in it, but I think it was just that, you know, gravity was just pulling me different direction. And, um, and I was getting him back in good form. I had, a, you know, his first year he come in, Alex, he, um, I wasn't in the best of, you know, best of mental states and, 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 you know, form as well. And, you know, I was ready to hang up the boots then and there, but, True. you know, I, I thought I was like, nah, man, like I'll, you know, I'd kick myself if I didn't give it a red hot crack, you know, for another year. And if obviously if I still feel the exact same way about rugby itself, then, you know, then, then I'll call it a day. But so I ended up just having a red hot crack and then, you know, coming back into form, and then just still something wasn't feeling right. So I was just like, oh, look. So I sat down with um, with Al and the, and, the, and the club. And then they're very understanding. They said, yeah, look, if you miss your family that much, if you miss your home that much, we're not going to stand in the way. And obviously they've got, you know, exciting young young players there now. Um, so they're in good hands. When, when I left, I didn't leave them and, you know, <laughs> with no wingers at all. And obviously they've got a lot of experience there as well. So, you uh, know. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it was pretty good. It was pretty good timing to part, to be fair, because then now I can get back home because I'll get back in like I think Feb the fifteenth. I get out uh, out of MIQ, oh, okay. and um, and I think the first, I think its first game is the eighteenth. I think it is of Feb. I think so. Perfect. Miss preseason straight in there. <laughs> no, I doubt it, bro. All these guys are just chomping at the bits to get me in their preseason camps, mate. <laughs> but you, you, home is Auckland for you, eh? So is that ideally where you want to be? With the Blues or yeah. Moana Pacifica? Or would you even go back to the Warriors with the league? Or the nah, league in Auckland anyway? Because they're not in Auckland, eh? Because <laughs> yeah. I was speaking to uh, Ben Murdoch. I was just, just chatting to him about, like, obviously, life and how I'm coming back home. Yeah, but now, nah, yeah, ideally, I think uh, back to Auckland. Um, I'm not going to say who yet, so I'm just, I'm just ideally yeah. Auckland. I, I'd like to, you know, be around my family. Like I said, that's my number one priority at the minute, it's just being around my family. You know, if I can be in Auckland, that'll be, you know, that'll be a bonus. So... Yeah. So if a team like the Crusaders or someone were the ones to come knocking, would you sign with them or ideally you'd be looking to stay in that Auckland region? Oh, mate, like that, that's a tough one, isn't it? It's like saying, yeah. do you want to come back to like the best New Zealand rugby team in history? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Crusaders has got a, like a massive history. Like every every club does. And that's yeah. like that's the hardest thing. And that's probably why I'm so excited about this. Any club I go to at the minute, the, the yeah. history and the you know everything behind that club and the franchise itself, it's just mental. And like mm-hmm. you know, I, I do I get excited when I sign for sale because you know it was the exact same year. But just thinking about obviously back home, how you used to watch like all the other like dudes growing up, all the ex All Blacks growing up, you know they're all Crusaders, um, Hurricanes, Blues. So yeah. like, you know that's that's what's exciting me at the minute. Mate, exciting times, exciting times for New Zealand fans. But anyway, before we get too far, pretty keen to hear about what your life was like growing up. And I know you're brought up in Auckland, so um, give us the rundown for you. Oh, mate, what's not to tell? Uh, <laughs> right, you know, a little South Auckland kid growing up in yeah. Otara. Obviously went to you know public schools, getting up to all, all, like up to no good at, at every chance I could. Um <laughs> Yeah, my mom and dad were pretty like um, they they knew straight away that I wasn't keen on school anyway. I only went to eat my lunch, play some rugby. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to nick a few bikes here and there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, mate, I was a little, I was, I was a little. Uh, what can you swear on this, bro? Yeah, if, if yeah, sure you can. <laughs> oh no, nah, I was just a little <laughs> uh, devious child, eh? Like, just I was just up to no good, and like, like I didn't want any other way. I just wanted to be naughty. I just wanted to want to play rugby, eat my lunch, yeah. be with my mates. But yeah, no, growing up in South Auckland was decent, bro. Like, if I don't feel like if it wasn't for growing up in South Auckland and the hardships that came with it, wouldn't have given me what I have now. Um, I think it was the resilience, obviously, of um, just keep going. Of you know, no matter what you had or what you what you're gonna do, it's it's about the the outcome that's that 
eventually is going to happen. And whether it's mm. positive or negative, you just got to, you got no other option but to keep going. Mm. And I feel like that's probably what like South Auckland's given me, and probably like life in general as well. And you were a gun at rugby, eh, from a very young age. I've heard lots of stories about how good you were as a young kid. When did you know that you were a gifted rugby player? Oh, it's... Mate, I, I think it was just trying to, like, enjoy it, really. I didn't really buy too much into, like, oh, mate, you're so good, you're so good. Mm. I just loved, I just loved loving rugby. I think yeah. everything about rugby, playing like from when I was five, playing with my older brothers, you know, because my dad had to coach it, and there was another way for my for my dad to coach me. He was like, you either come up two grades or you stay down there, and you get coached by someone else. And I was like, nah, stuff that. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come play. I'll come play with my brothers, <laughs> and I'll and I'll get coached by you. And then so it just happened from there. So like obviously, when six year old, seven, eight nine, ten, so then I ended up playing with my brother and his mates and, you know, all of them were just like, I, it just it was just like bred into me, just like any other Kiwi that's back there as well, which is awesome, mm. how they just love, if if the kids can manage the, that, that age group, you know, chuck him in, have a go. Yeah. And you know, that's what my dad did and I think that's that's kind of what helped me with the confidence in like, especially in a, in a massive contact sport. You know, I had no fear in, in any contact and whatsoever, and I was just throwing myself in it. Mm. But no, I think probably when I took it like mad serious is probably when I used to go on like preseason camps to Melbourne when I was um, at uh, St Peter's College. Yeah. So they signed How me. How old were you like, then? Uh, so they signed me when I was quite young, eh? So I was like 16, 15, 16. But during, but during that, the day, they were saying, we will sign you now, so when you turn 18, finish school, you come and join our under-20s. Yeah. And that was their, um, so that was their competition, and I was like, oh, okay, sweet. I kept going, and I was I kept doing these pre-season camps, and I was just like, every time I kept flying over to Melbourne, I was just falling more and more in love with it. Mm. So I ended up, I think it was about 16, 17, going on maybe 17, I called... Uh, Melbourne Storm and I was like look like I'm really keen on coming over I know you guys got an SG ball um, competition which is the under 18s I'd like to come and play in it and I'd like to move my family over like what do you reckon and uh, Frank Panisi at the time he's still the the CEO there the manager there and he said mate no dramas come around they set me up with my me and my family in, in a nice area in Melbourne and um, I ended up uh, taking my little brother and sister out of school and putting them into like a, a you know a pretty pretty good school over in Australia. All right. Was there any other reason why you wanted to get out of Auckland or was that anything to do with that or was it purely just um, the rugby side opportunities? No, so like obviously Blues and um, Melbourne were were my, my two teams that I was like keen on playing for it. and then I I did meet up with someone from the Blues and yeah. obviously it, I, for some reason, some somehow it fell through, and then the week after, Melbourne ended up coming. So I was just like coming in and offering me this contract when I was, you know, so, such a young age, and I was dead keen on just providing for my family. Yeah. You know, everyone loves, you know, giving back to their their family and their parents, and because I loved it so much, I was like, I'm going to get paid for what I love. So I don't care what I'm what I need to give my parents. I don't care. They can have it all. I just love playing rugby, and I can get, you know, I can give back. Yeah. And so when they came, I was, it was just a no-brainer. I was like, oh, Greg Inglis, Billy Slater, Cameron, uh, Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk. Bro, there was all these, like, superstars at Melbourne. Oh, I was yeah. just like, oh, I'm keen. And because I used to yeah. play rugby league as well after, like, our first 15 times. And so we used to play for first 15 and then first 13 as well. But I used to go, I used to have to go to, um, like, my old club at Odahu Leopards. Yeah. We had to play there because um, I, we didn't. Uh, St. Peter's didn't have a first thirteen; they only had a, a first fifteen. Oh, so yeah. I was just like, "Oh, sweet! I have to go there." And luckily, my family friend was like, "Oh, you keen on playing?" I was like, "Look, I'll give you any sport a go." I was doing athletics. I was doing even indoor netball, outdoor yeah. netball. I was doing everything. So I was like, "Yeah, I'm keen for anything, bro." Man, that's crazy. So you were like fifteen, sixteen years old, 
flying over to the Melbourne Storm, training with these absolute legends of the sport. That's buzzy. Mate, it was it was surreal. I was going in. We, I think there was about, I would say about six of us. They put us in a hotel opposite uh, where they were. I think it was Princess Park at the time. And um, we used to just keep walking over. And, mate, the training was hectic. It was <laughs> unbelievable. I think if you talk to anyone that's experienced any like Melbourne Storm training or even been at the club, mate, it is it is brutal. Yeah. And what what were all those guys like? What were they like in, uh, letting you come into the environment? Were they all good sorts, or what did they make you work for? You um, oh, respect? Nah, they're they're a decent bro. They're like you know they 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 welcomed you in because they knew we were just there for the preseason, just to experience it with obviously the next generation, hopefully, and coming up. But mate, they just loved it. They just said, as long as you put your head down, graft, then you can have a coffee with us any day. They weren't really like segregated groups. They welcomed mm. us in. Um, you know, I remember Billy Slater giving me a first tip on you know how to track a ball in the, in, in the air. I'll never yeah. forget that. Um, so yeah, so it's like, mate. As soon as the first day I went in, I felt like I've been there for for years. So mm. uh, yeah, when and especially at a young age like that, it's so daunting going with a group of like you know grown men. Probably it was they're probably like 20, 25 at the time when I went, but. Yeah, mate, it was it was hectic. I, I loved it, mate. That's crazy. And were you a fullback at the time in league? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, um, I was, I loved fullback, bro. I just, yeah, and that's so that's when I signed for. So when I signed for Melbourne Melbourne Storm, they were basically like I was going to be the next Billy Slater. Obviously, that was like a mad like reputation to try and live up to as well. Yeah. So every chance I could get, I was just asking them, "What are you doing? How do you do this?" What are your thoughts in these situations? So yeah. I learned a lot when I was when I was growing up and when I was in the system for a while as well. And um, I was fortunate, eh? Because like I got a gig, so they they gave it to me because obviously I just wanted to be around Storm. I just wanted to be around the players. I knew I didn't want school. I just want to be around the players, train, um, you know, get as much experience as you can. But basically, I used to just uh, wash the shakers, set up training. <laughs> pack away training uh <laughs> give them the you know the seniors their shakers if, if they're like denny i'm missing the scoop mate i'll run around like a madman so i was like there like you know an hour before training an hour after um uh, packing training setting up training doing training and i was just like but because i loved it so much i was just like mate i don't care like i get to do this like although it was just a work experience basically being <laughs> being a bum boy of just like everyone at Melbourne. I was just like, I love it. I'm just training. <laughs> was that when you'd signed on? Because you eventually did sign in the full squad, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So obviously in, in 20s, it's not a full-time contract. You yeah. you go, you, you come in at like 4 o'clock in the morning, you train at like 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, you go off either school, work, or whatever or course you're doing, you go off and do that. And then you come back at around like, I don't know, it was 4.35 again for your afternoon session. So they were saying, instead of doing that, we'll have we'll put you in a work experience. We'll pay you like, I think it was like 5,000 extra dollars on top, which wasn't much, but I would rather do that than go and like dig holes for, you know, the whole day and then have to go and do some hard graft after. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, so they just said, yeah, so let's just do that. So I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm down for that. True. And what was life like doing that move? You obviously come from South Auckland, moving over to Melbourne with your family. What was life off the field like? Mate, it was crazy. Uh, where did I start? It was, it was, it was basically like, it was, it's all a blur at the minute. Eh? Like when I look back, I'm like, bro, them years flew by. <laughs> uh, I, all I remember is like the really good stuff, um, just being in with the lads, training, playing 20s, you know, and then, obviously getting like an opportunity here and there, but obviously taken away because Billy Slater will back up on, the, you know, play the Wednesday in the uh, Queensland Cup um, and then play again for Melbourne on the Saturday. And I was just like, bloody hell, mate, just take a day off. <laughs> so like, you know, just stuff like that. I just, all I remember that. And then just obviously going through that, where that transition period between 20s and first grade, it was like, 
I didn't I didn't know where I was. I was just I got injured. Um, I was gutted, and because I got given everything from the start, I kind of had that had that uh, silver spoon mentality. Mm. And then I was kicking stones. I was like, no, I deserve this. I deserve that. When I didn't deserve nothing, you know, yeah. I was still, I still needed to do what I need to do, graft, put my head down and wait for my opportunity to look like everyone else. And, you know, unfortunately for me at the time, I was young, I was stupid. I, you know, I had that mentality about me. I was like, well, I've been here for so long. I deserve, you know, I deserve a shot for, mm -hmm. <laughs> without doing anything to be fair. And, you know, that's where I was at Melbourne and that's, that was that was probably the most upsetting part. Probably the only bit I, I regret in my career at the minute. And what was your relationship with alcohol and um, drugs? Not just probably in Melbourne, but even before that, even back in Auckland. No, so Auckland was for sweet. I was just you know just that young stupid teenager that was sneaking off and drinking every day, every, every <laughs> like now and then. You know, <laughs> everyone did it, um, but Melbourne it was just like I don't know how it come along. It was just you know, it snuck up on me. Obviously, yeah. it was around that period of where I was thinking like how I was thinking, just mad, like, I was just like, how can they disrespect me like this? And I was like, well, when thinking back to it, I'm like, they didn't, A, they didn't disrespect me. B, they didn't, I didn't, like, deserve nothing. You know what yeah. I mean? And it was around that time where I was just like, well, stuff this, bro. Like, so alcohol came in, you know, girls, you know, drugs, you know, that recreational stuff, obviously, and mm. none of that, like, hard stuff, stuff, <laughs> that, you know what I mean? So it was just like, and then it ended up becoming, like, almost a, a vicious cycle. So anytime I felt a certain way, you know, upset or disappointed, that's how I vented. So yeah. obviously, and I was under the radar. I was always injured, you know, that was for the next years coming. I was always injured. Um, I was always in the physio room. So it was a dark time. So I was just like, I just couldn't get out of that 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 cycle of life that I was living at the minute. And then mm. it was when they sat me down and was like, "Look, like you know, obviously you need some game time against men. You know, I feel like going overseas to England for London Broncos is, is probably the best move for you. Um, you know, how about it? And because I was so young and naive, I was just like, you know what, like. I need to prove myself. I need to do this. So yeah, go on. I'll have a crap. And then I ended up like um, stupidly signing it. And my agent at the time just done me over. He pulled my pants down to the max, <laughs> and I was just like, "Wow!" At the time, because he, because obviously the English pound and Australian dollar, like at the time, I think it was like almost, almost triple or double, if that. Yeah. So that's how he spoke to me. She was like, you're going to get around this much, this much. And I was just like, oh, bro, that will be sick. Yeah. Yeah, sign me up. Being stupid, I just signed. I was, I think I was still 20 at the time, just turning 20. 20. Yeah. Right. And um, obviously, I, I was still stuck in that, um, that, that, that cycle of how I was feeling to how I would portray that and how I will like, uh, release that feeling as well. So obviously, as a young 20-year-old going – halfway across the world I didn't know what was gonna what what was gonna happen so stupidly I, I signed it I jumped on that plane after everyone was saying you know they advised me otherwise but I was yeah. like nah I need to do this I need to get back into NRL I'm, I'm gonna kill it bro if you know and that's that's a great thing about hindsight isn't it <laughs> I was like, little did I know I was going to be staying here for another couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I signed for, I signed for London at, you know, it's 20. And what a, what a town, what a city. Um, you know, coming from Melbourne, it was awesome. Like, it was party. It was like, it was literally, wouldn't sleep. Yeah. So, and that year, literally playing-wise, it was probably the worst in my career ever. Um and off 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 the field like the lads are sweet i had a great time we had an awesome chat uh we had drinks every time even if we lost we we didn't win we barely won that that year i think we yeah. won one game 
and you know throughout that time it was dark it was getting it was i think it was winter so it was getting dark at like 3 p.m mm. and i was just like what is going on I'm, <laughs> we're losing by 60 points it's getting dark by 3 p.m yeah i'm missing home i've got you know i'm halfway around the country i've got you know luckily the club paid for our um our accommodation because you know when he was converting that money and like it's it's all relevant to where you are so when i moved to london mate the prices were just through the roof and i was just like mate i've got i actually can't afford to live some months so like <laughs> it was it was crazy so like obviously like with the losing with the the you know the bad weather i was just in a i was just in a massive hole eh? so i was just mm. that's i think that's where the drinking and the drugs started amplifying because that's where it was at its darkest. We were losing. And then I ended up trying to get back over to Melbourne and then they ended up saying, nah, sorry, mate. Like there's, there's not, there's, there's not a gig here for you anymore. Oh, so I was crazy. just like, what? This is crazy. So like, I ended up like breaking down. Eh? Like just, so I was like, my family's there. Like I've got nowhere else to go. The transfer window has gone as well for NRL, so there was literally no way possible for me to even get back home. So I ended up just sacking that uh, Australian agent that I had at the time, yeah, and signing with someone from England, hope like just in the hopes just to get me one more year, just to give me a good team, so I could play my way back to Australia or back to New Zealand, mm. and then signed for Castleford, and you know, and. The first year, mate, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was, good. it was good. You know, the fans were awesome. You know, the stadium was packed every single game. You know, we were winning reasonably like, you know, the ratio to winning and losing was as a normal team. So I was yeah. like, oh, this is, this is a lot better. I can deal with this. <laughs> so like, but the weather still wasn't that great. <laughs> and luckily, like, I ended up going back home for my 21st before I went to, to cast, went back to England. Yeah, and that was tough because obviously I missed home. I just wanted mm. to stay in stay in Melbourne. So yeah, then I ended up signing for Castleford the the year after. And for Castleford, mate, on the field you were on absolute fire. Scored all sorts of tries from everywhere. I think you broke the record for most tries in a season. I think you were even yeah. in the frame for Man of Steel or the biggest accolade there is over there. So mate, your form on the field was on fire, but um, off the field were you still up to the same? um things off yeah. the field yeah mate and it was just like it was crazy because it it started off like it started off as just like an outlet of you know of of my emotions of how i dealt with it but then yeah it was just this growing like feeling and i didn't i didn't understand what it was and i was like like you said i, I you know the season of my life and but as soon as i left the field see as soon as i left the training ground it's just a, a sense of emptiness, if that makes sense. I just, mm. other than being a rugby player, I didn't know who I was or what I was going to do or what I was even about. Yeah. And that's what I struggled with, like like my identity off the pitch. Uh, and obviously everyone knew me as the rugby player and that was kind of it. And that's all I knew I was. And that's kind of like probably the the underlying feeling of what where it came from is I didn't understand how to um just basically all in be in order of my life so i didn't understand how to like separate being a rugby player to just being a normal guy that's out in the street or yeah. having a conversation there, there, there was literally no separation it was either rugby or nothing and i because i didn't have rugby well, after rugby i didn't know who i was so i, I had nothing all i had was alcohol and, and drugs what did a normal week sort of look like for you? Were you on the piss all the time? Were you doing drugs all the time, or was it just sort of oh, after a game? Yes, so bro, I was just I was just on the piss all the time. So I have like couple, like at least three bottles of of you know of wine or red on a Wednesday. We'll play on a Friday. Oh, like, wow. It was like so. I wake up hungover. I'll go to captain's run. We'll do captain's run. I'll sleep all day. Just wake up. I'll make sure I swig it, you know, a bottle or two of water before I go and play, and then I'll go and play like that. Yeah, and, that, and that's how it was kind of like it was going. Mm. 
So yeah, bro, it was it was hectic on the field and it was it was hectic off the field as well. <laughs> so were you living by yourself or were you going out with mates to drink these bottles of wine or um, do your drugs? Nah, I, was, was it... I was just at home. I was just well, at yeah, home just by on yourself. my own. True. I'll play some music, obviously, and then just one bottle will lead to the next, the next will lead to the other one, and then I'll have one in like in the cupboard that I hide away, and then I'll end up finding that one. And it was it, obviously looking back at it, it was it was dark, bro. It's like obviously I, and that's probably why I do what I do now um, with mm. with all this whole mental health um, situations and, and campaigns that, that you know I, that I offer myself to, because I did it all alone, and you know yeah. when I didn't need to, and I felt I isolated myself as well, and I alienated everyone around me because I didn't. I, I that's. I didn't know how to express my feelings. I didn't know mm. how to deal with the the fact of, you know, I I didn't know who I was. I didn't know mm. who I was when I left the field. And instead of obviously like chatting to someone about this this whole feeling, I just ended up drowning myself and I digging myself a bigger hole every time. Did any of your teammates know that you were? Uh in this sort of situation or they wouldn't have known because you're doing it all by yourself they wouldn't have known because i was doing it all myself yeah bro so like but then there was a one time where we went out and like um i say it in every you know every interview or podcast i do so it wasn't for if it wasn't for my best mate michael channing at the time he we basically went out i took um ketamine so like the horse tranquilizer like liquid yeah. form and I thought I was at like, and I was just like, I was just, I think it was almost at the end of the season. So it was coming up to like, obviously, you know, big games, big decisions on like Man of Steel. Um, you know, I was coming up to breaking the, the try scoring record. Like, I think it was a few weeks after. And I just thought, fuck, I can't, I can't deal with this head noise anymore. Like, mm. um, I, I, it's too much for me. So I ended up taking it and. I got up to all sorts. I was trying to fight police officers. Um, oh, yeah. I think I ended up doing something stupid, passing out. My best mate took me home back to his and his, his partner's house at the time, back in Leeds, and waking up in the morning. So they stayed up all night looking after me. Like They thought I wasn't breathing at times. So they stayed awake looking after me. And the morning after, I woke up like an absolute helmet, and was hey guys, how's it going? Good morning. <laughs> and mate, they weren't happy at all, eh? And obviously, like oh, best yeah. mates, like you expect this kind of chat to come from, and you know, I'm, and I'm very fortunate for him, and I'm very thankful to to Mike for this. And you know, he, him and his missus uh, said, "Look, mate, like last night was scary. We had to stay up for you. You weren't breathing at some at some point of the night." Um, there's something wrong, bro. You got to sort yourself out because this isn't the first time. This has just been the worst time. Mm. Like, this isn't the first time. And so I ended up saying, "Yeah, shit." Like, you know, I'm sorry. I, that, that shouldn't have happened. The first couple of days, I was in denial. I was like, "Nah, they're just they're just chatting rubbish." And you know, I'm I'm not like that. I don't need to see someone. Yeah. And then it was probably like back into the week where I was getting a bit nervous for the game. The game happened. Then it was back to that 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 feeling that head noise. So I was just like, nah, yeah, they're right. Something's not, something's got to give. And mm. I ended up seeing someone from Sporting Chance, which helps uh, Super League, which helped Super League at the time. They're like a, like a sports, like a players unions, um, like a place where you can go and, and seek help. Yeah. So that was, so that's, that's kind of was a stepping stone towards it to help me identify what was going on. And then, that year I ended up signing for sale because obviously me and uh, me and the coach had a, had a bit of words obviously you know things happen and with disagreements happen and you know I ended up signing signing over at sale so obviously that kind of was put on the back burners like my whole trying to identify who I was as a, as a man or as a, as a person mm. kind of got put on back on the back burner because the, the scrutiny I got, the, the social media hate, you know, everything about the move was, it was just like, it was just mad crazy. I just didn't understand where to, where to look. 
And mm-hmm. luckily for say, like lucky for me, Sale ended up saying, "Denny, just don't even look at your phone. We'll handle like all the legal processes. Like you do what you need to do. You just jump on that field and score us some tries." So I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, sweet. I'm good at that." <laughs> <laughs> And then, like, it was crazy because I, I was like, yeah, sweet, I'm, I'm just good at playing. I, I just block out the head noise, block out the fans. So I kind of put myself and everything about me, a- apart from playing rugby, and on the back burner for that first year. And then, like, funny enough, like, when I did it, I was playing some, like, awesome rugby. Mm-hmm. I ended up having a chat with Eddie Jones and he was like, look, mate, what, what's your, what's your plans? You've been here come this year. You've been here for five years and that's your eligible, um, your, the eligibility rule is to be here for five years. You can play for England. And I was like, so I looked back at what I've achieved, what I've done. And I was like, you know what? I don't feel like I want to leave now. Anyway, I feel like England's given me so much like, maybe this is a way to give back as well. And then, you know, financially, the financial gains from playing for England as well also helped. You know, I'm not going to lie, it, you know, it, was, it gave a good cushion. And obviously, mm. you know, coming from, you know, a guy from South Auckland that's, you know, got yeah. nothing. If you throw that at him, you're just like, yeah, sweet. Like, give it to me, bro. What were so, you like with your money going through the whole sort of grades? To be fair, some parts I was good, some parts I was bad. Um, I ended up investing in property. Yeah. So like, obviously that was like the good thing about it. But then I could have invested in a lot more and I ended up just splurging it, mainly splurging it. Yeah. I'll probably like, move. so when I uh, played for England, I ended up trying to buy a house in, in, in the local area to, to sale. So I ended up buying that house, putting some money into that. So that that was the main of it of, of of where I spent most of my money, but I was still young. I was only like twenty three, I think, at the time. Oh, right. Crazy. Yeah. Twenty three or twenty four. So like, and I was getting all this money. I was just spending like crazy. I was just doing stupid things, going out for dinner, going out for like expensive nights out, yeah. and so like that that sort of stuff on that that front kept happening, and obviously that was just. It, it came to a point where I think I got, I got kicked out of England England camp for drinking with Manu. Uh, oh, true. Talk to me about this one. How did this <laughs> Did you lead him astray? Or? <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I think it was like, you know, I'm, I'm my own man. I made my own decision and so was he. Yeah. So we, we ended up just drinking. Obviously, you know, coach was like, yeah, sweet. I like, have the night off, lads. Like, you know, have, enjoy yourselves. But he didn't, he probably didn't mean go out to, a, you know, out into London Central and enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, that obviously looking back at it, like, I was still only very young. Like, I was 24, I think. And I was just like, mate, I'm like, nothing's wrong in my life at the minute. I'm playing mm-hmm. awesome rugby. I'm, you know, I've represented England. Um, you know, I've, I've got the life of my dreams here. Like, I'm, you know, I was on cloud nine. <laughs> And obviously, it came crashing down when you know when he kicked us off the when we when he kicked us both out of the out of the squad, and it was kind of like a learning curve of just like mate, you can't keep taking the piss. Like, how many lives do you want? Mm. Um, so, I knew drinking was the problem. So, however, like stressed or head noise I had, drink was always the way I went about it. Yeah, and. You know, learn, like, and I think that was probably the main thing of just trying to get a different perspective on how to deal with the, these emotions and how to release them. And it wasn't probably till the following year where I was going through a divorce, and it was kind of like I was just like back and forth, like with all these emotions. And it was this guy Ollie from Savior World on my Instagram. <laughs> And James O'Connor was um, was in it as well, and he was like, "Look, bro, just come along. Like, I understand. You know, you're pulling, you pull, you're trying to pull against this 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 gravity that's pulling you towards this movement. Like, this is going to be good for you. You need this." Like, and I was like, "Nah, bro. Like, can't be asked. Like, that's too mm-hmm. much. 
it's, it's too out there for me. I, I, I'm more of just, I'll just deal with it myself kind of thing. And he was like, bro, you know what, suit yourself. Like, you know, you can take the, the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah. So I was just like, yes, yeah, right, that's sweet, bro. And probably when I was going through that divorce and it was like that period where I needed to make that decision whether I was going to be in the marriage or not. And I made that decision to not be in that marriage anymore. So I, I broke up, you know, we, we had a divorce, mate. And then probably the day after I hit him up and I was like, hey, mate, like, you know, my name's Danny. Um, you know, James O'Connor, you know, introduced us a few day, a few weeks back. Do you mind if we come and have a chat? And bro, I feel like that changed my life, eh? Because mm. it was just, it was just teaching me how to be me without forcing me to, to do anything else, if that makes sense. So he's being more of my subconscious and saying, do you really need to do that? Or do you feel like this is the right thing for you at the time? And if I'm honest, he did a lot of digging. We did a lot of soul searching. We did a lot of like grounding. And I've done, I've not done that much crying ever in my life. Yeah. I feel like a lot of trauma built over, over the years came out, obviously just going through, you know, the marriage, uh, England pressure, the pressure of, you know, coming into sale after an awesome year. So just, just everything in general kind of just got on top of me and I didn't know how else other to release it than, than drugs and alcohol. Mm. And, you know, fortunately enough for rugby union, they, they're quite strict. So them drugs were probably like, you know, prescriptive drugs. So, you know, sleepers and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, Ollie was just like, mate, like get a grip, bro. Like you either have a look at yourself and look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, what do you want to do with your life? how you want to live it or you succumb to this feeling and you, you allow it to dominate you for the rest of your life. And so he gave me tools and ways to, you know, dictate that feeling, um, understand it more. And, and when I do feel it, which is awesome at the minute, like I have ways and means to deal with it other than alcohol now. Yeah. And, you know, especially with my little family, it, it was so important and mm. it was funny. Like it was, crazy how it all worked out like when when me and ollie ended up you know parting ways because it was just like well i've got nothing more to teach you i feel like i'm leaving you at the best place that i I can see you in and then i ended up meeting my partner so i was just like bloody hell I was like this couldn't <laughs> like you can't make it up yeah and you know and it was awesome i think for her as well just like for me to understand my own feelings, my own emotions, <clears throat> and you know, so that she we're on the same page every time I'm feeling a certain way. So mm. yeah, that it's been awesome. So what are what are those ways that you use now instead of going to the drink or to drugs? Because I mean, there's a lot of guys out there who'll be feeling those same sort of things or turning to the bottle still. So what, have you got any sort of tips or anything you could recommend for some of these guys? Oh, bro, as simple as it sounds, like breathing helps. Like sitting yourself in a calm room, like people call it meditating, people call it yoga, you know, anything that sorts of like you have to control your breathing, focus on your breathing more, it, it, it helped me. So like I, I had two dogs at the time and I loved walking. So I loved walking and we used to take them on hikes. So getting out in fresh air, having that walk in the morning to, to release that, that um, stimulant in your in your mind and your brain that gives you them good um, hormones. I think it's called mm -hmm. endorphins. I think it is. Yeah. So if you release them quite early, like it's almost like I think that quote is "Win the morning, you win the day." So if you can do something that um, benefits you and will put your mind in the right track, you know it, it'll it'll go a long way. So I think like I used to, well before I had my partner, I used to be in a like a really strict regime. Obviously, wake up make my bed, go down, feed my dogs, we'll go out, come back, let them out, let them back in, get changed for training, then I'll go. So that's mm -hmm. that was my morning, it was every morning. And if I did anything out of sorts, it'll send me nuts, eh? I'll just feel like I'll be all over the place. <laughs> so obviously, like, 
having a child now is, it kind of puts it all into like <laughs> into shambles really so you can't really have a set time but you know I just looking back and looking back on my life and my career although it was all in the spotlight when it when when I wasn't in the spotlight when I was in in my home and behind back closed doors them dark times still I grew from that and I le- I learned from it and it taught me a lot and that's probably why I do, like I said, like how I helped out with um, mental health campaigns, just to, just to get put my message out there, just to make obviously, like you said, every every, it, it can happen to anyone, mm. it, you know, you can be a guy that works nine to five, you can be a sports athlete like me. Depression and you know anxiety and all these things don't, they don't care who you are. Yeah, they're just like, hey, bro. <laughs> nice it's nice to meet you <laughs> <laughs> oh mate you're doing awesome awesome work in that space and I know a lot of people will be getting a lot of stuff out of it especially this one in particular but one thing that sort of stands out for me throughout your career is how you still manage to be so good on the field with what you're doing off it like um, you obviously weren't doing mu- as, m- as much training as some um, you were straight on to the drink and straight into your drugs your recovery and stuff probably wasn't that good but nah. when you got on the field mate you were you were just next level like you would still rip it up even though you were sort of professional but didn't have that professional mindset yeah well it's funny uh i had it when i crossed the line <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was everything yeah. An athlete needs to be when I cross that line, and I say I even I even joke about it now. I'm yeah. like I even tell my missus and my because when I first met my missus, she was like, "Oh, do you need to be on this? Do you need to do that?" And I was just like, yeah. "Look, love, like I'm the worst athlete you're ever gonna meet." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I don't do diets. I, you know, I don't do like your conventional like. You know, I need to go a sauna. I need a spa. I need a massage mm-hmm. here and there, like." I'm I'm chilled, bro. Like, as long as I'm good and I feel good, I I don't care. Like, yeah. you know what I mean. Like, I'm surrounded by my family that loves me. I'm loving myself more and more every day, and, and as I am with my family, just loving them more and more every day. Mm. I, it's just awesome, and I know I've got I've still got a lot left in me, and yeah. I know that, like I said in my interview in the New Zealand Herald, that 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 itch on my back. I know it's I know it's in New Zealand and speaking to my missus just recently she's like you've done probably a lot in Australia and England every country you've gone to and I said but you've started at New Zealand so and because you didn't do much there other than playing first 15 playing all these sports when you're at school you haven't really gone back and played any rugby there Mm. and I was like yeah and, she, and I was just chatting to her I was like yeah but there's obviously the money wise like you know I don't want to leave us like short I, I want to make sure that we live life to the full as well and she's like Danny like money is just money we can go there experiences you can't get back you can't physically pay to get an experience back mm. and I was just like fire out yeah you're right like I would probably regret it if I didn't do this now, if that makes sense. Yeah. And obviously, I'm still, I'm still probably at, at a pretty decent age to go back and you know play some decent footy. You're in your prime. And man. I know, and I know, uh, Brent Evans has gone back to Highland as well. And he's bloody yeah. killing it, mate. You know what well, I mean? So got I, mean, I think he's about. Yeah, I think he's about thirty-five, bro. <laughs> Oh, mate, no, nah, definitely not too late. Oh, that's exciting times. Um, also, so, something else that happened in your career, you've sort of spoken about it, but was your divorce, and I know it was sort of a high-profile relationship. Um, I'm not sure how your ex became famous, but I've seen lots of photos of you guys walking the catwalks and living the very <laughs> glamorous life. What was what was that relationship like, and how did that one come about? Oh, mate. I've never really said it on on air or, or you know in an interview before, but because I was so young, I met her at a time where I where I struggled the most. Yeah, I think I mistaken 
gratitude for love. And mm. obviously, you know, she came at the time where I probably needed someone to come in and and intercept whatever was happening at the, at that time in my life. Yeah. So yeah, so I think, you know, at the time I was just more grateful and you know, we did hit it off like we, you know, we had a lot in common. We had, you know, like everyone does, but I think the overriding feeling that was going in that relationship was more grateful. And I, because I didn't even know how to portray my feelings or even understand my own. So I didn't understand the difference between grateful and love. And obviously later down in the line, you know, that, that gratitude ended up sliding, you know, I was just like, well, I, it ended up being thrown back in my face at times because obviously she came at the time she did and I wasn't going to sit there and allow it to be thrown back in my face just because you know some people come in your life for a reason and some you know and they leave and mm -hmm. you know fortunate enough you know it was it was a lesson learned on my part to to really get stuck into to identifying how I feel and that's one mm -hmm. thing I did work a lot with Ollie before meeting my partner because I didn't want to make that mistake again. Yeah. I wanted to to understand the differences of how I feel and when I feel it and what scenarios it's going to come to be prepared because you know you never know what's going to happen. You know, life life throws you curveballs every chance mm -hmm. it gets. So mm -hmm. like. I just wanted to be as prepared as I could if I was to get into another relationship. It wouldn't be the same, if that makes sense. I, I would understand yeah. myself more to then give her more of a chance to be loved and me receive it as well. Mm. And I was just so self-destructive at the time as well. I just, any chance I could get, I would just be like, well, boom, I'm going to throw the bomb. I'll just detonate it. So I was just, I was just all over the shop. So like, yeah, so it's the first time that I've said it, that I was, I, I, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm it, it's sad to say that I, at the time I was grateful rather than, rather than love. Yeah. And did the, did the whole publicity around the relationship make it way more harder? Did you enjoy that side of things? So the cameras, the, the articles, all that sort yeah. of thing? Bro, at the time, I'm not going to lie, like, I loved it. You know, I was like, oh, yeah. I'm in the paper for something other than rugby. So, yeah, yeah. I loved it. And because, identity. like I said, I struggled with that identity mm. thing. So I got caught up in that lifestyle. So yeah. then, uh, you know, that and that was the whole kind of snowball where it just it just kept on going. And then, obviously, things, went, things happened. Like, she had to pretend that she was single for shows. Um, and obviously because my mental state wasn't as as tough as you know most people probably wouldn't even allow it in the first place i just let it go you know what i mean i was just like fuck uh, you know what i mean so i was just i was just going on for the ride and then what do you mean she had to be um she had the act single for shows like what what sort of shows are those so she did x on the beach and that so like do you know them single um reality shows and was she with you at the time? Yeah, she was with me at the time. And then she did uh, Big Brother as well. Celebrity Big Brother. And mate, oh, like, even even some of the sale lads, like the week that was going on, like mate, my anxiety levels, bro, I was just all over the shop. And Fair like enough. one day in training, I took too, too many diazes and I was training like an absolute shit out. So I was just like... <laughs> I don't know where I am, <laughs> and um, just you know, it, well, luckily all the boys had my back. They're just like, bro, just go and have a have a rest. Like, we'll tell them you you know you're sick. You you need to go home and and, and sleep it off. Mm. And yes, yeah, so, like it cost me a lot that relationship, but it it it, it made me realise a lot as well. It, it taught me a lot, bro. Like, yeah. just from everything about that, and obviously I've still got. A lot to learn still I st you know no man's perfect no woman's perfect you know, our relationships go through you know highs and lows still but you know it was it's a lot better than what I used to be doing mm. so yeah you know, and I and I'm 
I can look back and be proud of myself of where I've come from. Mm. And another thing that teaches you things pretty quickly is children. I know from experience, yeah. but how have you found being a dad? Bro, I love it. Hey, like, yeah, just everything about it, bro. Just like she puts a smile on my face every time I like think of her. Um, she's just coming. Like, I reckon she's hitting terrible twos at early A eh? because <laughs> <laughs> her attitude, bro. And I was like, nah, not now. We've got like an eighteen-hour flight on our second haul. <clears throat> I was like, I can't be dealing with this this attitude. This this indecisiveness i was like i can't be dealing with this <laughs> and how long's your miq is that two weeks still uh 10 days yeah so oh, 10 I'll days, be, i land on the the fifth and get out on the 15th and mate it's been stressful eh? like i've been just trying to find a house i'm still trying to find a place to rent True. back home so Not it's easy, just eh? been it's just been mental oh eh? yeah especially how expensive you... it is bro Oh, I know. Are you selling up your place over in England, or you keep that? No, over so there? we're yeah, uh, we're keeping it. We're renting it out. Um, yeah. So sorry, we just got news. Uh, my my partner and my daughter's visas got approved. Yes. <laughs> sorry, bro. Uh, she's just <laughs> yeah, she's just come through, and she's like, it's been approved. Oh, how good. Sorry, bro. That's awesome. <laughs> no, no worries. That's awesome. That's awesome. Told you, did not it? When did that have to be approved just, by? Well, just by the time we got into New Zealand. <laughs> oh, true. All right, so but it was cutting crazy. I was just like, yeah, because she was being mad stressed about this lately, and I think yeah, fair enough. And going back to like you know our mindset about what we do in our lives is just about just believing in it, eh? Like one hundred percent. And I felt like this whole week everything kind of fell into place. So mm. obviously our tenants for our property here now in, in, that, in our house here, they're coming in and they're, they're wanting to move in as the day after we leave the house. Oh, yeah. And obviously just then, our visas just come through approved um, before I just sold my one of my properties here in, um, in England here as well to fund out obviously the visas just to make sure that New Zealand know they're only here for a holiday yeah. um, and we've got enough funds. So we had to sell up. I was, cause I was already selling anyway. And then I was, Oh, well we can look at a house over there and try and buy it. But I ended up finding out you need 20% deposit. <laughs> I was That's like, ridiculous. mate, who has 20% on like a average house? There's probably like 2 million. And I'm like, who the hell has 20% of $2 million? It's like, mate, you've got to be so out of your now, mind. Mm, crazy. Hey, eh? what is it over there? Well, average, you can get a three bed terrace for like I reckon two two fifty three hundred thousand. And what's pound. the deposit? So that's like, oh five. So if you if you're a first home buyer, five percent because then the government puts five percent. So that's their scheme. Oh, and then but generally it's like ten percent. Yeah, mate, twenty percent. Welcome to New Zealand. <laughs> it is, home. yeah. So we're not. I was like proper confident, eh? I was like, bro, I've got this much coming. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm selling my house. You know, this is what's going on. I've got rent behind me as well. So what's what's the crack? They're like, yeah, you need twenty percent. I was just like, no. I was like, mate. What? So what is your plans? Are you are you going to stay in New Zealand long term? Do you see yourself finishing here, moving here back for good, or you haven't got that far? No, nah, I haven't got that far, bro. I, you know, I'm just got as far as landing in New Zealand, bro. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, I've got like I need to sort out obviously like a, an accommodation to stay in when we leave when we get out there 15th. But I still haven't like figured that out. It's the 24th of Jan. We leave on the 3rd of Feb. So like I'm mm -hmm. cutting it a bit short here. <laughs> <laughs> but like I was oh, saying to my missus, I was like, when I first made the decision to obviously sign and go to speak to, to say all about this decision that I'm about to make. I, I sat her down and I was just like, look, I need 100%. I don't want even 1% doubt or 99% behind me. So if we mm. make this decision as a family, as, as a couple right now, we need 100%. So I need, a, I need all in. I don't want no chips being hidden. I need, you know, all guns blazing, 
you know, yeah. everything in it. She was like, I've got you. We've got this. And I was like, as long as I've got you behind my back, when I'm going to make this decision, I know everything's going to happen. And I've always had that mentality anyway. So I'll go and mm -hmm. give everything I've got. And fortunate for us, like, like I just said, everything just this last maybe week, everything's fallen into place for us to come back home to New Zealand. And, mate, and that's probably why I'm so excited, like, talking to you as well. It's just like, mate, I've not heard anyone back home in New Zealand or Australia in a long time. So hearing, like, <laughs> homegrown accents is, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, what accent have you got? That's sort of half-half. Bro, it's a hybrid. <laughs> it's, it's a, it was a bit like my mental state. It looks like... <laughs> <laughs> oh mate it's exciting time so mate i can't wait to yeah. um, see you out there in a super rugby team playing some super rugby it's going to be awesome but mate Me anyway too, before bro. we uh as always we've gone to our instagram for some questions and mate lots of people have come in for you lots of good stuff so we'll get through them uh first question is it true that at the storm you were faster than billy slater a hundred percent mate Hundred percent. Were you? Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Rapid. So he was, mate. He was just like quick. So he was agile, just nifty. Yeah. Obviously, top end speed. Yeah, I, I, I got Billy. See you later. <laughs> Whoa, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's your favourite player to watch in Super Rugby and why? Super Rugby, bro. I've got two A, eh? and it, you know, they. They're crazy, like they're literally polar opposites. But um, Adi Savera at the minute, just as yeah. like just as his dynamics of how he how he plays rugby, um, and just the way he he thinks, and as a captain as well, like just the maturity of his of his rugby, mm. and probably the, the the other exciting one was um, Caleb Clark. Yeah, uh, yeah, bro, he is a beast. And obviously, like having Roger there now with him, uh, I'm looking forward to Roger. And if I get to play with or against, I'm just going to be admiring a pair of them. Yeah. But obviously, everyone knows, you know. That... Did you grow up with Roger? Did you play against Roger as a young fella? One of those questions came in. Yeah, we went to the same school together. We went to Oru College. So I went oh, to yeah. Oru College first as because as it was our public school. And obviously, I got a, schol um, a scholarship to go and play for St. St. Peter's at the time as well. So I ended up leaving Odoo College and going to St. Peter's, and we played against them for first 15. Oh, and yeah. Roger was playing fullback at the time, and I was playing uh, 13 at the time. Excuse me. True. True. How do you reckon he's going to go in rugby? Mate, he's, he's a natural athlete. He's, he kills it. I feel like... Regardless of where, and I, I've read that he wants to play twelve, and I think that's a perfect position for him. He, you know, he's come from a league background as well, yeah. so like have that physicality about him. He, he, you know, he wants it, he greets it. He's played fullback, so his skill set's going to be there, you know. And I think he's just got the all round game. I think if you're a Blues fan, you're going to be excited. Mm. Hey, and my, they might potentially add you on the wing. Do you see yourself as yeah. a pure? Pure winger, or do you see yourself playing potentially midfield? Could you play anywhere else? Oh, bro, you see, I've, I've had this argument with a lot of people. Like, the only reason why I play winger is because when you're in like, first grade or when you're playing league, if you're a young back player coming to play, you play wing first. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> unfortunate for me that I ended up playing very well, and I just <laughs> had to be stuck there. <laughs> but no, I, I would like to play anywhere, bro. Like if it's the wing that they need me, if then I'll play wing. If it's, mm. you know, I, I'm a utility. I want to play all sorts of positions and I want to impact the game just as much as the next bloke. And mm. I feel like I've got a lot, lot more to offer coming back home with a lot of experience behind my, you know, under my belt. And that's what I'm trying to get, come back and bring home to, to, you know, to New Zealand rugby. Oh, I can't wait. I got lots of questions about this one. What NPC team would you like to play for? Lots of people asking <laughs> if you'd come to the Southland Stags. Bro, I've seen that. Eh? The, they're, they're throwing up the Stags up there. I think uh, <laughs> Ben Boyle as well. He's 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 a local lad from there as well, isn't he? Oh, true. <laughs> so um, uh, to be fair, bro, like I'm not 
as long as it's you know it's the right kind of game style you know play style for myself because I want to I want to I want to play some expansive rugby I haven't played mm. expansive rugby in years and obviously I'd, I'd like to get back to you know throwing the ball around with no no pressure that I'm going to get dropped the next week <laughs> so like any like obviously I'm going to have to go do, do my homework now just figure out what team kind of I want to slot into not I want to mold to me I want to mm. go in they've already got that kind of that game style that you know that coach's philosophy and I want to just slot in and look like I've been there for years so that's what I want to do bro Mate, you sound the perfect fit for the Tasman Marco, actually. Here, <laughs> hey, that's your local team as well, isn't it? Hey, let me know if you want to come play here. We'll see. <laughs> okay, next question. Best Eddie Jones story. Oh, mate. I've got too many. <laughs> but there's obviously... Um, there was, there was this one time we were in Argentina camp and one of the boys are, are well known for for obviously getting up to no good. And um, he was just, he put him in, basically he put him in hotel prison. So <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow him out. I can't tell you the name because, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit private. It wasn't mate, not yet. He literally, w- <laughs> no, Charles, mate, I wish he did. <laughs> It, it probably would have made it easier. I wouldn't have got kicked out. But nah, he, you know, he put him in basically put him in house arrest. So he would just only be allowed to come and eat, come for the meetings, go to train, anything else. He was back in his room. I was like, bro, are you sure? So he and he he was dead serious as well. And he put him up at the front because you always fall asleep in meetings. Oh, true. So he'll be like right at the front, right near Eddie. And he always yeah. put him like Eddie always throw him banter as well, so it was quite funny. But that's like my my biggest one that I I tell everyone like, what's Eddie like? Yeah. He just loves what? rugby, bro. He loves taking the piss out of everyone. Yeah. He loves having a laugh. What was he like with you? What were you, what was he like to you? He was he was decent, but to be fair, he under, like he he got to know me quite fast. He kind of yeah. understood what I was about. Obviously, my family was was my biggest you know motivator. Mm. Um, and obviously he just said, look, like, what would you do if, you know, your family was, was doing this, doing that? How would you react? Would your energy levels be this, do that? He was almost like a, a psychologist in there. Mm. He, he loves mind games as well. So whether he was trying to play mind games and I just thought he was being a nice dude, <laughs> I don't know. But <laughs> he, I feel, I think he was these, I, I think he was these, I learned a lot from him because I mm. think my favorite story of him is he used to watch like Russian rugby like or like some rugby could be played in somewhere in the world that no one knows of. He yeah. finds that game and he likes watching it just to find that probably that one thing he might be yeah. interested in just to bring in. He loves yeah, rugby and I, I, I kind of like enjoyed how much he liked rugby or he loved rugby and it taught me mm. a lot. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, next question. Got a lot of ones like this from, uh, obviously you're a big deal over in Sale. Got lots of fans over there. Most of them just wanted to know, how do you find your time at Sale? Oh, bro. I think that's this is where all my, my fondest memories of England have come from. Yeah. Um, the day, day one I got there, I was expecting their like sales fans to hate me for, for you know, for obviously obvious reasons. Uh, made their op- they welcomed me with open arms. Uh, I think the first lap I did, I took photos. They're just expressing how much they enjoyed watching me. Even in rugby league, they said, "Look, I'm I'm, I'm a both. I, I love both codes. I love watching you in league, and now I get to watch you live here for sale. The club they love, mm-hmm. and just the love and passion that they had for the club. Like we're we're a team dominated by football and." You know, to have, you know, Manchester born and bred play, uh, fans come to watch us other than, you know, Man United and Man City football, it was awesome. And just to get, just to understand their passion and their love for sale as a club, it kind of made me want to do and play a bit more for them. Mm. Yeah, they love it Loves over it, there, eh? 
Right. Yeah. And, and I remember playing against Sale one night, and mate, I've still got your shoulder imprinted on my ribs. <laughs> no, <laughs> mate. Oh, the Not spot me. tackle from you, mate. I'll have to try and dig up that footage. It's still, <laughs> still sore when I look down at it. <laughs> oh, bro. Honestly, I, like, because because I'm such like, I I don't like being a grub on the field, but I just like love the contact day. Eh? Cause, yeah. Because coming from rugby league, we I had no contact, so I was like, any chance I could get, I would just try mm. and like either run straight into someone or just tackle someone. So, yeah. nah, bro, I don't think you did it. I think you injured me, mate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. This is this could go anywhere, this one. What is your biggest bender? <laughs> sounds, sounds, <laughs> like, <laughs> sounds like it's been the last eight years. But <laughs> who's, who's asked that? <laughs> <laughs> Give me one, one of my mates, mates that's a proper <laughs> stitch-up. <laughs> oh, I plead the fifth, bro. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eight years. Uh, my life's a blur. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next one. Who was your best roomie? Sam James, uh, bro. Oh, yeah. Swear down, Sam James, bro. Uh, I remember. So it was my first year up until probably only last year that i that i've never had him as a roomie mate decent dude decent crack um we'd always watch a film we'd always sit there and we'll have like i think we'll have like a packet of chocolate and a packet of sweets each we'll sit there we'll just chat about the film i it just everything about sam james bro i just loved him eh? he's yeah. a great dude off and on the pitch um the skill set he had bro and he was down downright the best room because I, I love gaming as well so he'll just let yeah. me game like he'll just let me game all night he won't even budge he would, like, I think <laughs> we only had one disagreement is when I I think we're in um, in Spain and I, I think I snored the house down <laughs> he ended up waking up at like 6 o'clock in the morning going to the beach to sleep on the beach and one of the, <laughs> the sun beds there and his missus ends up texting me like Danny, you better wake up now and let Sam James back in the room and stop snoring. And I was just like, oh, bro, I'm so sorry. Mate, that was oh. the, probably the only disagreement we've ever had whilst rooming right. together. Oh, wow, that's good stuff. Okay, next question. Would you play for Samoa? This one came up a few times. Obviously, you played for Samoa in rugby league, which we didn't even really get yeah. to touch on. Played England and Union, so I think the... How many how many years ago was it that you played for England? I think it's been three, I think. Three or four years. So one or two more years and then you're eligible to play for Samoa. No, no, so I, no. Is it is it five years, is it? I think it I think it's five. Could be wrong. Has it been five years since I've played for England? Well i I'm still, I'm eligible now. Oh you're eligible. Oh you can play yeah, for Yeah, yeah. Oh true. Yeah, oh, wow. so like it is it is like Probably it wasn't the decisive move of why I wanted to come back to New Zealand. Like I said, it was for my family. And yeah. obviously, conveniently enough, like the decision got overturned when I made the decision. Yeah. Um, like I said in my New Zealand Herald um, interview, I just, if it happens, it happens. All I want to do is focus on going back, playing some, some good footy and like I said, um, just because I played for England doesn't mean, you know, the coach for Sam was going to just turn around and say, yeah, you're going to be, like, automatically in. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm playing some good rugby and he ends up calling my name, yeah, why not? You know, no one, it's very rare for anyone to experience a World Cup. And I would love for that to happen, especially at the end of my career as well. And mm. it will be awesome. I think it will be a great experience for me and it will be a great, like, you know, Tick at a box of, of my career and what I've done so far. Mate, yeah, that's an awesome character to be at the end of the day at World yeah, Cup yeah. over in France playing for Samoa. And the team 100%. will be really stacked now with this rule change, won't it? There's so many guys Bro. that have become available, added to who, the guys they've already got, and it's going to be a real strong side. Yeah, I feel like for every every nation, I think that's that's the most exciting thing. Like Every nation is going to be uh, – it probably we won't – you know, obviously back into the, the you know the game maybe you know England New Zealand Aussie France you know, they, they might sneak it they might you know end up 
having momentum. But it's just the, the fact of having possibly an even ground to start on. Mm. I feel like that's the most exciting thing for, for everyone that represents, uh, like that, you know, enjoys, you know, the island rugby. And I know mm. a lot of islanders have, have pulled through and, you know, the, that could be potentially coming back, which is, this is very exciting. Yeah, mate, looking forward to that. How good. Okay, last question. Best piece of advice you've ever received? And, mate, going from this podcast, it sounds like you've got a lot. Oh, bro. It's too many, eh? Like, the biggest one, like, I think, for me, myself, how I took it is, is just to love yourself, be patient with yourself. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be your own worst um, critic as well. Mm. So you need to take time to love yourself take care of yourself, be patient, you know, we're all human, that's how I took it, um, obviously I I put myself through the ringer, you know, I doubted myself, and everyone's going to, I feel like you need to, you know, believe in yourself that you can do it, and, you know, like I said, love yourself, I feel like that's probably my biggest one, Mate, and there's oh. multiple ways in doing so, bro, like, just small ways, taking yourself for a walk, Doing something that's good for your soul, bro. That's that's like what how I took it. Like for Eat me, it was, it was enjoying a nice cup of coffee after a dog walk. You know, that's that was mine. Love that, love that, mate. So good, so much good stuff in that podcast, and mate. Really appreciate you coming on and being so open and honest about your career to date. Because obviously, it's been a very eventful one. You've had your highs, you've had your lows, but. Um, like we've talked about already, I'm super excited to see you on this side of the world with your family, all settled in and playing some Unreal Super Rugby and hopefully on the international stage with Sama. Nah, bro, appreciate you having me, bro. Thank you very much. It's a privilege, eh? Thank you very much. Mate, mate you're a lad. Appreciate it.